So I don't like politics. I rarely watch or follow the news. And I really don't like the idea of playing politics, especially as a coach. To me, I think it kind of feels inauthentic um, and manipulative. So my perspective up until recently has been just do the right thing, give your best and, and treat people well as a leader. And that's all we can do. So when Nate encouraged me to read this book by Carl Pearson, The Politics of Coaching, I'll be honest, I wasn't too excited. <laughs> but after reading the book and then talking with Carl in this interview, which we're about to share, I've got a new perspective. Uh, I think it's important to be aware of the political nature of coaching. And it's not just okay, but it's probably smart to do at least a few things in your coaching so the political nature of things, the politics doesn't hurt you. Maybe it even helps you. Now, if that perspective doesn't sit well with you, give us two episodes. Uh, in our conversation with Carl, he might just change your mind like he changed mine. Uh, welcome back to the Coaching Culture Podcast. I'm JP Nurbin, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. This podcast is sponsored and produced by TOC Culture Consulting. We help coaches build better cultures and become better leaders. Learn more at tocculture.com, where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and get the notes to this and every episode. Well, Carl, we're excited to have you on the podcast here. I know it's been uh, over 10 years since the Politics of, Politics of Coaching was published. Um, and as I was, we were talking off air a little bit, it's been a really influential book for me because it landed in my lap at just the right time. I was kind of going through a a parent rebellion at my first school and they were lobbying the superintendent at the gas station and sending letters and phone calls to the school board. And so when I, I got my hands on your book after you spoke at our coaches association in Iowa, it was like just speaking right into a lot of the things that I was going through at the time. And now 10 years later, I've been through a lot of those situations again. And I know a lot of coaches can relate to just a lot of the pain points um, that you talk about in the book. So we're going to try to unpack a few of those as we go along in our conversation. But I want to get you started on this. I know you're a social studies teacher and, and I was too. And so I relate with some of the references in the book. But, but why did you title the book and sort of approach it from a vantage point of politics? Well, why not call the book Skills for Successful Coaching? Like, what is it about politics? And that word might have meant something differently 10 years than it, 10 years ago than it does today. But why start there with coaches? That's a really good question. And and honestly, I was trying to brainstorm a better title for the book because I know that the word politics, a lot of coaches are just averse to, right? They, they, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, but ultimately, when you look at the content of the book, I mean, that's what it revolves around. And uh, there, I couldn't think of any other word to describe it in an accurate fashion. Um, so the the politics of coaching, while not a compelling title. It's an accurate title. Yeah. So for coaches that, you know, maybe even aren't thinking through their coaching responsibilities through that lens, what is it that you mean by the politics part of coaching? Well, so much of what we do in coaching is interacting with other people. And, and that can be developing relationships, but it can just be points of contact or impressions that you make, whether it's the local media, the booster club, your administration. Um, and, and there's a, a different dynamic in all those relationships that we have to deal with as coaches. You know, I think a lot of times coaches think, well, I just want to coach. I, I want to make practice plans and deal with X's and O's. I don't want to deal with all that politics. But the thing that I've said for years to coaches is politics are ingrained in coaching. You can either embrace that and use it to your advantage, or you can ignore it at your own peril. And unfortunately, what happens, I think, with a lot of the coaches that find themselves getting run out of their position is they have ignored the politics. Some of the, the things that go on, whether it's parents talking to administration or school board members or, you know, what's going on down at the local cafe, what, what people are saying about your program. And if, if you are ignorant to all those things, it is far more likely that you're going to be victimized and find yourself on the wrong end of longevity in this profession, right? I mean, we all, we all want to have longevity as coaches, but for those of us that do, it's usually because we have found a way to navigate through some of the political pitfalls that coaching involves. 
So Carl, I've, I've written a couple of books as well too. And, and so often those aren't just books that I'm sharing things that I've learned or studied from others. It's from my own experience. You know, it's some of my own pitfalls that I've fallen into. So I'm just kind of curious what along your coaching journey made you realize this was something that needed to be talked about. This is something so important for every coach. Well, it's actually something I address in the introduction of the book. Um, I had an epiphany of sorts. One of my best friends in coaching got fired. And this was a guy that did everything right. I mean, worked with the youth programs, did skill development in the summers, was very successful. I think in his eight or nine seasons as a head coach, he'd only had one losing season and, and a lot of success in those other seasons. Uh, so when he was fired, I was stunned. And so I, I drove down to visit with him for a weekend. And as we kind of recapped the events of the previous year or two, as he's talking me through things, I'm seeing all these red flags that are popping up. But that I'm seeing that because I grew up in a very politically involved family. I was a political science major in college, right? So I've, I've always been immersed in politics uh, on a level beyond coaching. And he was really oblivious to all these different things that were going on. And, and I'm listening to this thinking, well, this is probably what happens to coaches everywhere. They don't recognize the warning signs. And so after we visited, a couple of days later, I woke up in the middle of the night and I just started sketching out a, an outline for the book. I had all these ideas pouring out of my head, like here's things that coaches need to be aware of and watch out for and, and do in a preemptive fashion to prevent problems. And, and that's really how the book came about. Um, because one of my friends lost their job. And I knew that he was not unique. I knew that that was pretty common amongst coaches, no matter the sport, no matter the state. Well, we're going to get into a few specific aspects, kind of pitfalls that a lot of coaches deal with or can fall into. But I want to ask kind of a broad question here first. As I read through the book, you know, if you were going to ask me, what are the two most common themes, regardless of the, the places of conflict or, you know, the different decisions that have to be made as a coach, it seems like relationships and communication are the two things that you keep coming back to. And I wonder if you could just talk broadly for a second before we get into some specifics about why relationships and communication seem to be the key to being able to handle the politics of coaching. Well, let's start with communication, because to me, that is the number one thing. And unfortunately, there's a lot of coaches out there that have been told uh, never talk about playing time or, you know, implement a policy that says you can't talk to me 24 hours after a game or in, until 24 hours. And there's all these different rules. Or I, I know I referenced this in the book, but one of the most audacious things I've heard a coach do, and, and they shared this with me, is they said, if I ever get an angry email from a parent, I print it off and I post it in the locker room. And I thought, holy cow, that's, I mean, that's, that's quite a so anyway, the point is being able to communicate effectively with parents and not close off that line of communication is really one of the most important keys to, again, having longevity in coaching. And, and the, the thing that I've, I've said for years to coaches is, if you say to parents, I'm not going to talk to you about playing time, which by the way, is about 90% of what parents ever want to talk about, right? I mean, so if you take that off the table, you're never going to communicate with parents. But if you say, I'm not going to talk to you about this, it doesn't mean the parent's not going to talk about playing time. They're just going to go above your head. They're going to go to the athletic director. They're going to go to school board members. And now the genie's out of the bottle. So now that those administrators that are above you have it on their plate, they're going to start asking you questions and, and investigating things. And now you, you've lost control of the situation. Whereas if you have the courage, and I know it's uncomfortable to sit down with those parents that are, upset with you. But if you have the courage to do it and, and you know how to prepare yourself for that conversation, a lot of times that is where the whole process will end. Many, many times, all a parent wants to do is vent. And, and once they've kind of had their say with you, they don't go on to principals and administrators. Now, that's not true all the time, but it's true most of the time. And so having that open line of communication with parents and players and community members, it prevents so many problems. Again, will you have a sleepless night after you have a parent dress you down in a meeting and tell you how awful you are? Yeah, you might. But 
you'll also keep your job in most cases. Now, in terms of the relationships thing that you brought up, uh, that's the other thing that prevents tons of problems. And that is if you, if you don't, and I mean, I think 90 or 95% of us as coaches are pretty good at this. If you don't see your players as commodities or as chips or as chess pieces, but you actually see them as people and you, you cultivate that relationship with them and you demonstrate that you care about them outside the confines of your program by going to their band concerts or, or going to watch them play baseball or softball or whatever sport you don't coach them in. Um, things like that matter and it matters to their parents and it matters to them. And again, they'll give you a lot more of a leash and, and well, we didn't play as much in this game as we wanted, but they know you still care about them. And so building those kind of relationships, um, that prevents a lot of problems as well. Carl, I, I love what you shared there on both accounts, but I want to explore a little bit more of what you've talked about in communication, because when I reflect on myself as a coach, I think for years, I thought I was a great communicator. I communicate my standards and my rules and you know all the schedule and when I expected people and how I expected to show up. And with the parents, it was like, hey, here's what I will not talk about, right? And I said, oh, I'm a great communicator. But what you just shared there is about the underdeveloped part of communication, which is listening, <laughs> which is bringing parents in. And I, I now it's instead of I will not have these conversations, I, I try to encourage coaches, hey, these are the conversations I want to have. I want to know when something's on going on with your child at home or they're upset, they're not happy. I want to know, have a conversation when you're really bothered by something I've done in my behavior, or you're really bothered by the playing time stuff and you don't understand why. You may not agree, but you don't, you know, you don't understand if that's bothering you to, to your very point there, because it's, I want to get it out and open where it's not going to affect the rest of the culture. And I just think that that's really profound. How you pointed out there, just when you mentioned communication, all you were talking about is probably us being a little bit better listeners, right? Yeah, I think that that's true to a large extent. But as you were saying that, I was reminded of, of something I always did at our preseason parent meeting. And that is, I would tell them, I'm available anytime that you want to talk about something. If you have a question about why we played 2-3 zone or why we took a timeout in this situation, don't ask the parents up in the stands next to you because they don't know. I'm the only one that knows. Right. And, and so that's another thing that causes problems when you close off that communication with parents and then they start these rumors and speculation, you know, that that creates a, a cancerous environment amongst some of the parents in your program. And it can kind of lead to that insurrection of sorts. Right. So, again, I always say, come to me. I'm the only person that knows the answer. And again, as a coach, you can't be defensive about that. And, and one of the things I tell the parents is I'm not afraid to explain why we did what we did. And you know what? You can win doing a variety of things. I'd always point out how, you know, Syracuse won the national championship in men's college basketball playing nothing but 2-3 zone. And other teams win playing exclusively man to man. You can win doing anything as long as you as a coach can get your players to execute it. So we can we can debate and argue about what strategy is best. There's no right answer, right? It, it's it's what I thought was best given what I've seen in practice, what I think our players are good at executing and all those kinds of things and I'll I'll defend it, I'll explain it. Um, but the other thing that I acknowledge to parents at the outset is there will always be conflict between coaches and parents because as a parent, your only obligation is to look out for the best interest of your kid. And as a coach, we don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury of looking out for just one kid. We have to look out for the best interest of a whole team. And, and that's always going to be my first responsibility. And your first responsibility as a parent is your kid. So yeah, there's going to be some conflict there sometimes, but understand, I will never begrudge you for sticking up for your child because that's your responsibility as a parent. But I also would ask that you reciprocate and understand my responsibility is different than yours. My responsibility is to the team as a whole and to your kids second in most circumstances. You know, and, and one of the things I'll say is I'm going to do what's best for your kid every time that I can, but as soon as what's best for your kid is in conflict with what's best for our team. Well, I have to choose the team. And you know, that's where a lot of the problems fall. But again, if if the parents understand I'll respect their position, it's a little bit easier for them to respect mine. And then we don't have the the conflict. 
Well, I think another general principle that comes out in the book is really evident in kind of what you shared right there. And that is one big piece of this communication skill is framing, or, or that's a word that you hear a lot today, right? Is how we, we have this experience together. Maybe we you know, won a close game that we should have blown somebody out, or maybe, you know, we ended up playing six players instead of eight players, you know, then or whatever it might be that goes through. And everybody looks at that from a different perspective, but it's important for the coach to be able to frame those experiences in a way that's, as you said, sort of beneficial for the team, but also to do that in advance. So it's not a reaction to someone else's painting of the picture, but you're really the first one to grab the brush and say, all right, here's what's happened or here's what's going to happen. And I wonder if you could just sort of unpack a little bit about why that's so important to be able to, to accurately and specifically frame so many different situations as a coach as we go through a year. Well, as the coach, it's, it's, it's advantageous if you can kind of create or set the narrative. Right. And instead of, like you said, reacting to what other people are now starting to say, if you can preemptively frame it and say, and I'll, I'll use this as an example, and, and this, uh, this is referenced in the politics of coaching, then it also actually comes up in, in my newest book, The Other Side of Glory, uh, where I kind of recap a, a team season that is trying to make the state tournament for the first time. But they had a very challenging non conference schedule. Uh, in the other side of glory. And so before the season started at the preseason parent meeting, the head coach acknowledged there is no team. And he was right, by the way, when he said this, there's no team in the state playing a tougher non-conference schedule than us. And we're going to take some lumps. We're not going to start 10 and 0. But he said, that's okay. Because he, he equated all those difficult teams to getting in the weight room. And he said, you know, if, if, if we go in the weight room and we just lift five pound weights, well, we feel pretty good about ourselves, but are we getting any stronger? No, we're not getting any stronger. We're lifting the really heavy weights here at the start of the season and, and we're going to be sore and we're going to be beat up, but it's going to make us stronger and it's going to prepare us for the conference season and the postseason. Well, that helped him get through a tough time in the season where, you know, they were ranked in the top three or four to start the season. And they're four and six at Christmas or something like that. You know, they're four and six. And rather than the whole community calling for him to be fired because he got out in front of it, most of the people in the community recognized, oh yeah, you know, this is going to be good for us in the long run. We didn't expect to be 10 and 0. And so setting that narrative prevents a lot of problems as well. You mentioned something earlier around some of these conversations with parents around you're going to do what is best for that individual until it becomes in conflict with the team. And probably the part of your book that I was most interested to see your thoughts on was around confronting a cancer in our program. And this is where I think coaches really struggle. Playing time is obviously one hot topic, but then there's also this idea around cancers in the team and, and, and the effect that those have and to really tear down the culture and really hurt the performance and the trust um, that you're trying to build within the group. So when it comes to confronting these, these cancers within the program, you kind of give the example of two different stories from your, your coaching journey. One is Kelly and how you screwed it up there and let her kind of, you kept continuing to allow her to play and she really really kind of ruined that season for actually a fairly successful team. And then you compare that with Annie, which you, you feel like you got it right, you know? And, and so I'm just kind of curious if we could just explore when we know we have a cancer on the team, when we know it's hurting our team's culture, what can we do about it? Like what's your best recommendation um, to, as you talk about in the book, kind of really being aggressive in the treatment of that cancer well, I think the first step is, you know, you're always going to want to try and fix the kid, especially if they're talented, <laughs> right? I mean, if, if they're talented, it's, it's really, I mean, I used to say when we would have a, a kid that was kind of a pain in the rear end, or, or maybe sometimes it was their parent, right? Maybe the kid was fine, but the parent was a pain in the butt. I would tell my coaching staff, well, you know, for us to keep that kid, they better score about 22 points a game and get 10 rebounds a game because otherwise it's not worth dealing with the headaches, right? I mean, you better be really good if you're a pain in the butt. Um, 
but even still, you know, joking aside, the, the first thing you do is you try to address it with the kid and help the kid, right? Because you don't want to just cut bait and, I mean, we're, we're in this profession to help kids. And, and so the easy thing is probably just to cut that kid and move on. But is that the best thing for the kid? No, probably not. So you try to address it with the kid, but you also have to do it with the understanding that, hey, these are the parameters by which you have to be a part of our program. And if you can't follow those, then we're going to have to let you go. You know, we're going to have to go a different direction. And so as long as they understand that up front and not in a threatening way, right? I mean, understanding, hey, we're trying to help you. We, we want to help you be a better player. But if you can't abide by these things, then this isn't going to work for you or us. Uh, the next step is making sure the parents understand where you're coming from with that too. Uh, you know, you don't just have that conversation with the kid because sometimes a lot gets lost in translation when the kid goes back and tells mom and dad, here's what we just talked about. This is, the coach threatened he's going to kick me off the team. You know, and, and that's maybe not at all how you phrased it. But the really probably the most important aspect of this in, in getting a cancer removed from your team is having administrative support. Because if, if your athletic director or your principal or your administration is not on board, with suspending that kid or, or cutting that kid from the team, boy, you, you can't take that hardline approach. And so you need to talk with them in advance too and make sure they understand, here's what I've done to try to mitigate the problem. Uh, it's not working. And here's what we need to do now and make sure that they're on board. Because if they're not, you, know, you, 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 you might tell that kid, all right, that's it. You're off the team or you're suspended the rest of the season. And then if the administration undermines you, and says, oh no, that kid's back on the team. Well, now you're in a, a very weak position as a coach. And so it's gotta be those three entities, the player, the parents, and the administration that you've all connected with before you can remove that kid from the team. I think that's a, you know, totally in line with the approach that and the, with the heart with which we all try to coach with. You know, we wanna help this individual. And I like how you mentioned there, you're laying it out. Hey, this is our expectations. You don't meet these expectations. Sadly, you, you can't be a part of this team. It's not in a threatening way. It's just, a here's the reality of the situation. I think, and you mentioned this in the book, what's really hard about the situation is that so often the, the team cancer, or as I call them, the culture killers, these, these cancers, they don't necessarily do things that are like so obviously problematic, right? It's easy when they like, get busted with drugs or something that's clearly against the policy. But so often the team cancer is not that individual. It's small little behaviors. As you talk about that, they don't high five their teammate. And like, what are you supposed to write up in a report? Like they do not high five their teammate when they, when they walk off the court. Like, how does that become a, a removal? Like, you know, there you go. Now we got to get rid of her. Like it, it's hard for us to a justify this with parents, administrators, even an individual, but it's also even harder. I think, to justify in our own mind as a coach to remove that player. Cause it's never anything that's just so like, Oh yeah, that's it. They're done. It's always like these little things over time. And you're like, yeah, but maybe they could turn it around or maybe it's not that bad. Or could I really get rid of this player because they don't high five their teammates when they come off the court, but we know it's so much more than that. You just can't see it. So how do you know when it's time if you've got parent support or, or not even a parent support, but administration support. And how do you do that? Well, I'm, it's interesting you brought that up because as you were saying this, uh, the high five situation um, in, in the season that we kept this kid on the team all year and they were this corrosive influence on our team. And, and even though we won 20 games and, and, you know, from the outside looking in, we're successful. It was just a miserable season. Nobody had any fun, myself included. Uh, I think we had about eight or nine team meetings that year. I don't know if you added up the other 16 years I was a head coach, if we had eight or nine total team meetings in the other 16 years. But I remember kind of early on when I was kind of trying to justify it to myself that, you know, it's not so bad. And, you know, this, this kid's pretty good. We're going to be fine. Talking with the players, I remember saying, she's not high-fiving you? I mean, am I supposed to be the high-five police? What, 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 really, are we really concerned about this? But you, as you said, that's one small thing of a whole bunch of just kind of little things that add up to a big problem. Um, and so 
it is hard. And, and in that case, I didn't have administrative support because I told them exactly what you said. I said, well, it's, you know, all these little things. And they're like, well, that, that doesn't add up to a suspension. We can't support you on that. Um, so I think the, the, the thing that you need to do is outline to, again to the kid and the parents, not just here's what we don't want you to do. Here's what a good teammate looks like. This is the kind of behavior you should be engaging in. And, and when they don't do it, say, hey, this, this is what I want you to do. Remember, we need you to do this. And then if, if you catch them doing the wrong thing, you know, it's okay to point that out, but make sure you catch them doing the right thing too and reinforce that behavior. When, when they have done the, you know, they, uh, one of your players took a charge and they run over and they help pick that kid up off the floor, right? You need to pat that kid on the back and say, yes, that's what being a good teammate looks like. And that's how you can begin to cure it, right? And it, it's not always curable. Um, but you know, that's what you want to try to do. Um, and then ultimately, you know, in, in the situation you described, uh, from my, my first anecdote in the book, uh, this, this particular player had been talking about transferring. And so that was my door, right? I, at the end of the season, I said, Hey, I've, I've been hearing that you want to transfer. I want you to be happy. You let me know what I can do to help you. And we're going to get you to a school where you're going to be happy. And then, you know, the kid ultimately transferred. And so that took care of the problem without me having to be the bad guy and cutting them or, uh, or, or, you know, going against what my administration wants. Now, it's not always going to be that easy, um, but that's how it worked out in that situation. Well, I think JP's right on in that so many of these behaviors either are, they seem trite in a single episode or a lot of times I think they're hidden behind closed doors. You know, they're things that are said in the locker room when you're not there, or it's, it's parents that are talking up in the stands during games. And obviously you're not there to referee or defend yourself in those conversations. And sometimes that mix between a, a player that can become a cancer is really driven by the influence at the dinner table, you know, and what they're hearing at home. And so you talk about this in the book, but when you have a parent cancer, you know, and obviously the fear obviously is, is that it will spread, right? That it doesn't just sit at that dining room table, but then it becomes a small confluence of parents and, you know, other disgruntled parents grab on. All of a sudden, you've got yourself a, a movement. How do you handle it when it's it's coming from home, you know, more than from an individual player? Um, yeah, that's it's a really difficult one to deal with because you have control over the kid, right? You can bench the kid if they're showing a bad attitude or if they're not working hard at practice or whatever the case may be. You can't bench a parent. <laughs> and, and so, and, and it's wrong to punish the kid because the parent's being a jerk, right? You, you don't ever want to take that approach either. But that's why, you know, one of the things that I do, or I, I've recommended and that I did as a coach is before the season, I would sit down with my administration, with my athletic director and not like overtly do this, but, you know, kind of say, Hey, you know, as we're talking about the season, watch out for uh, Mrs. Johnson. I mean, the, the lady complains about everything. I don't know if you remember last year. You remember when she called and said, we need to retake our team pictures because there was a, a reflection off the floor over on the side. I mean, she's just, she always finds something to complain about. And so I would plant that seed with our administration. So when Miss Johnson inevitably called to complain about me as a coach, they've already got it in their mind. Oh, here we go. Here's crazy mom, right? And so I, I, I compare that to the political world in, you know, everybody says they hate negative ads. They hate negative political ads. So why do we continue to see them? Because they work, <laughs> because they're effective. And as a political scientist, one of the things that I was taught is the side that goes negative in a political campaign wins about 85% of the time, the side that goes negative first. And that's because you have now shaped the debate. And, and now the, your opponent, has this title that's been attached to them. And rather than talking about what they want to talk about, they have to defend that, that title that's been anointed to them. Well, it's very much the same when you kind of plant that seed with your administration and say, Mrs. Johnson's nuts. So now when she calls, she doesn't have a lot of credibility with them. And if you don't plant that seed, and, and I know this is, this is one of the most controversial aspects of my book. I've had a lot of people say, well, that's just wrong to do that. I say, okay, you know, it, it probably isn't the most it's not the moral high road. I get that. It's politics, right? And sometimes politics is a little dirty. But here's what happens if you don't plant that seed. 
Now, when Mrs. Johnson calls your athletic director and says, oh, the coach is doing this and he's doing this. Now the athletic director comes to you and says, well, here's what this parent called and asked me about, you know, what's going on. And now who's on the defensive? You are as the coach, right? And so doing that in advance helps at least with the administration. Now, in terms of dealing with the other parents, this is where that, again, that open communication comes in because you're right. One parent can infect a whole bunch of other parents. And so that's why it's so important that you say, hey, listen, rather than speculating up in the stands or pontificating with other parents about why we do what we do, come to me. I will always explain to you why we're doing what we're doing. And then that gives you that avenue to refute the conspiracy theories that the crazy parent might be spouting in the stands. Um, If you close off that communication, now the only person those other parents are hearing from is that parent that's trying to undermine you. I know when I first read the book, I highlighted more in that section. There's a heading that says label the crazy parent before they label you. That was like my favorite uh, section in the entire book, because I think we can all relate to that, right? The parents that don't have an accurate or realistic perspective of their daughter or their son or the team or you know whatever it might be. I think we've all had to deal with that at some point or another. And I think what, all, what else is, is interesting is, you know, as long as we're talking about cancers that can ruin a program is sometimes it can be an assistant coach. It can be a youth coach. It can be a booster club, you know, president or a member. It isn't always just, you know, the parent or the player that can have an undue influence um, that can undermine, you know, your approach or your entire season. So let's take the example of an assistant coach that just, you know, refuses to get on board and, and maybe is always second guessing with you know, with the players or with the parents and giving them a sympathetic ear and saying, you know, if I was the head coach, gosh, I wouldn't be playing zone, you know. Um, How do you handle uh, that kind of situation when it's somebody that's in your own house, but yet seems to be undermining what you're trying to do as a coach? Well, there's there's two ways you can approach that. Um, the the more positive approach is to to visit with that coach and say, hey, listen, I understand you have ambitions to be a head coach and I want to help you get there. But if you continue to undermine me, it's not going to be helpful to you or me because it makes you look bad. Um, There's going to, you know, even if you do happen to get my job, there's going to be a contingency of people that know how you got it. And they're not going to be supportive of you at the outset. So this isn't the right way to go about it. Um, You know, I, I was in my 17 years as a head coach. I think I had about nine or 10 of my assistants go on to be head coaches. Um. And, and, you know, there were times that I had an ambitious young coach and I'd say, listen, I'm going to help you become a head coach, but it's not going to be by taking my job. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to connect you with an athletic director at another school when there's an opening, I'll advocate for you. Right. But I need you on board. We, we need to be on the same page here. Uh, so that's the positive approach. The only other way to deal with it, if, if that doesn't work and if the, the undermining continues is you have to let the coach go. Um, you, you just, you cannot continue to have that coach around and it's a difficult conversation to have. Now it's a little different when it's like a youth coach, as you said, somebody in your youth program, cause you don't have hiring and firing ability over them sometimes. Um, in, in that case, you know, I, I know I dealt with our, our traveling basketball association and I would say, well, here's what I want our youth coaches to do. I want them to run the same stuff that kids are going to run when they get to the high school level. And I would usually have, you know, let's say you have eight different teams, fifth grade through eighth grade. I'd have about six of those eight coaches on board doing our stuff. And then I always have two of them that decided they were smarter than me (laughs) and they're running the flex offense because that's what they ran in high school or, you know, whatever it is. And so eventually I would have to just sit down with those coaches. and, And what I would say is, all right, if you continue to do this, you're hurting the kids on your team including your own kid, because if the the kid in the grade ahead of them is running our stuff, when they get to ninth and 10th grade, they're going to have a familiarity with our system that your son or daughter is not going to have, right? And so this isn't in your best interest or the kid's best interest. Whether you like our system or not, if you want to help your kid and their friends, you've got to run it. And, And that would usually kind of get through to them. But, you know, I think the other thing is when we're talking about youth coaches, is show up at their practices sometimes uh, and, and just be a resource or 
even if you're not there saying, well, run this, run that, um, which you probably shouldn't do all the time, just be there and be supportive and, and demonstrate that you care about what's going on with your sixth grade team. And that means a ton, not just to that coach, but to all those parents. I mean, boy, you build goodwill by doing that. Now, now the sixth grade parents are saying, hey, did you hear the varsity coach was at our practice? And, and I mean, it's just the coaching capital that you build from that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's invaluable. And so again, you can, you can prevent a lot of problems by outreach and by preemptive communication. One of the things I love that you shared there was around the assistant coach, uh, because I think so often I hear coaches when, when I say, Hey, what are like your non-negotiables for your coaching staff? One of them is always around the word loyalty. Like I want loyal coaches. and my challenge to coaches is like, well, okay, well, how are you earning that? You know, just because you gave them a job doesn't, you know, really, you know, bring that about, you know? Um, And I think what you suggested there is a bit of loyalty to the individual as well too. Like, Hey, this is, Oh, you want to be a head coach or, you know, just understanding what their goals are in coaching and saying, Hey, I'm going to help you in that. You know, I think that goes a long way to, encourage maybe a shared loyalty across that. You know, you're loyal to them, they're loyal to you. All right, that's it for part one. Thanks for listening in to the Coaching Culture Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and to check out The Politics of Coaching by Carl Pearson, available on Amazon. Next week, we'll be unpacking a few more topics from the book, as well as discussing his new book that was released, 